turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta-learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. Scott Gerber is the co-founder and CEO of The Community Company. He's the founder of the Young Entrepreneur Council and Forbes Council and author of the book, Never Get a Real Job. Scott and I talk about this new 2018 form of social media and branding and how people have not been doing it correctly. We talk about super connectors, people that understand the power of relationship building, problem solve by connecting the dots at high levels, and purposefully cause different worlds and communities to interact with the intention of creating mutual value. If you like this podcast, I would highly appreciate a review on iTunes because it helps the show grow even more. Enjoy. Scott, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Creating a lot of value for a lot of people. Uh, Friends, family, business, just building meaningful relationships with people and being as helpful and uh, uh, as valuable as I can to, to other humans. I love it, man. So I want to take a step back here and tell you why I invited you on the show. Um, so when I was 16 years old, I ended up starting a Minecraft server. And, you know, to me, it was all about like my friends, you know, what the fun we could have, the community, like the people that I talk to every day. And then next thing you know, basically that turned into a six figure business. So then when I shifted and I started my new business, people started calling me like this marketer, networker, you know, bro, how'd you grow your site? What are the social media hacks? And my answer was always just like, I don't, I don't really know. I just acted human. Like I didn't allow technology to distort my, my worldview. So that being said, let's get started. How do you, what do you, what do you think about that? Wow. Uh, you certainly had a lot of emotional intelligence uh, at a young age. Uh, I wish I was as uh, open-minded to my possibilities. No, I think, look, I think we have become so inhuman uh, and, and have removed ourselves from so much humanity because of just the proliferation of social media and technology and billion dollar industries that are vying for our attention and all these different things uh, that we sometimes forget at the end of the day, the most basic premise of humanity is relationships Mm -hmm. at its most core it's joe meets sally and they become friends or acquaintances or longtime lovers or whatever and then you go and meet the next person that becomes a friend or an acquaintance or a relationship or longtime lover and so the point is i think where we have strayed is we have let the system dictate the rules uh instead of listening to our most innate uh sense of being uh and and allowing that to set the rules uh, for everything from how to we communicate, to who we spend our time with, to how we spend our time with them, to what device is in our face on any given day. Um, and, and so I think really why my partner Ryan and I wrote the book Super Connector and how we live our lives and our business every day is really just going back to human and putting humanity first into the various things that matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that if more people did that and understood what that meant fundamentally, they'd have more fulfilling lives, more fulfilling business relationships, um, and, and probably would be more attuned to how to be a better person so that they could live a more fulfilling life in, in general. I love that. And, you know, I think part of that and, and why it's such a good idea to have a conversation and to write a book on it is, you know, this technology stuff, especially what we're talking about, it's super new and it's happening so fast. And, you know, if you take a a big step back, you know, humans don't know what this stuff is and, you know, we're just, we're playing around with it and there's all sorts of, you know, different studies coming out on how like people are misabusing technology and it's, you know, gaining stress levels and, at the end of the day, I think technology is a tool and I just think it's, you know, it, the tool itself is at a primitive age and uh, a lot of us are, think it's one or the other. Like a lot of us think it's, oh yeah, I'm going to look down on my phone all day and be in like this digital world. But in fact, you know, what I've come to experience is you got to use the digital world to bring you closer to the physical world. And mm-hmm. 
create real in, in, engaging contacts. Well, what's really funny is, so, you know, as I've been doing the book tour and talking to a lot of different folks, I get this, a version of this question pretty often, which I find hilarious, um, not to be insulting to the people that have asked it to me. I understand why they do, but the question is something like, you know, how do you recommend people act in the real world versus the digital one? And it's sort of a crazy question, right? Because I understand the point of why you ask it, because today people assume like there are these various different ways in which the Facebook world and the Twitter world are different than, you know, the real world. And the reality is, is that, you know, yeah, you, you might have a certain etiquette to a platform, right? You're not going to use all caps, even though you might want to scream because that's like, you know, a little bit over the top. The reality is, is that we forgot like to be yourself, to be your best self is to be yourself. And it doesn't matter if you're typing words, speaking them, putting it in audio, doing a video, like people should know who you really are. It's when we get so sucked into this stupid personal brand nonsense to the level of insanity that that persona becomes what people assume you are, who you are, um, that that just destroys the fundamental purpose for why these platforms were created in the first place. I mean, take a look today. Facebook, a couple of months ago now, obviously made a major turnaround. They realized, oops, that whole reason we built the platform to make better conversations and build relationships, yeah, that sort of backfired when brand marketers started to blast everything through a megaphone 24-7. And yeah, now we're going to cut all that off and go back to humanity first. I mean, the writing's on the wall. The reality is people don't want that crap. They want authenticity and not authenticity. They want actual authenticity. They want actual conversations, actual communication. They want to know that the person they're talking to, you know, is something beyond some sort of facade. And I think when you look at the world, you know, we put it in a certain parlance in the book of sort of this networker lens versus like the connector lens. And it's not semantics. There's a fundamental difference. I mean, I make this as a joke. I mean, you're in the business world. Tell me something great about the last networker you met. Um, they didn't, do it. They didn't <laughs> shut up about themselves. Exactly. Right. Nobody I've ever talked to has ever said, man, that was a great networker. That networker was awesome. I really wish I could be friends with that networker. Nobody does that. Right. And so the reality is, is that that mindset, which has basically been fostered by this personal brand technology infused world has become the transactional out for yourself, you know, personal gain at all costs. One to one. I'm always going to be the winner mentality. No buyer be damned, like I'm here to make a quota kind of kind of personality versus what humanity was built on, which is to be a connector, someone who's thinking about building a tribe or a community, be a long time facilitator of communication, not a short term value uh, opportunist, be someone who is actually thinking about meaningful conversation and digging deeper, not surface level to get what you want. Um, so, so I think that the whole framework actually fits nicely into where we are as a society today, because the reality is we are becoming fundamentally flawed human beings just by nature of the fact that things we're allowing in our lives are no longer selective, no longer valuable, and are taking our attention in fundamentally wrong directions or in fundamentally you know, wrong rabbit holes that we're going to fall down and never get back out of. So. That was, that was beautifully well said. And, uh, you know, I got to say a month, month and, and excuse me, not a month, a, one year and about two months ago, you know, when I was getting into the whole marketing trance, so to speak, uh, you know, I was kind of doing that. I was just throwing stuff out there, no traction, but you know, the second, the moment when I just like stopped and actually like realized what I was doing and, and made an effort to, to put in you know, and, and get meaningful and authentic connections with real human beings, everything changed. And like when you make that shift in how you interact with people online, the game completely changes for you. And, you know, people start getting vulnerable with you. People start, you know, talking to you about all this different stuff. You start attracting people that are similar to you. And I think that's an absolutely wonderful, beautiful thing that a lot of us lose sight in, in this 2018 world. Well, what's really funny is, you know, um, I ask this of marketers all the time because I always love the response. Um, you know, you've how many times have you met a marketer where you know they'll whether it's at a you know they're on stage or a talk or they're doing a webinar and they'll tell you about you know this is how you can growth hack to this conversion rate to get this at the bottom of the top of the funnel and the bottom of the funnel and this is how you talk to them and this is the word you use and all that stuff right and then you get them behind closed doors and you say hey man so when you're the target of that when you're the consumer or when you're the person. So do you click those emails and do you read that copy and do you buy that product? He goes, no, because I know the game. 
that's the insanity of what we're talking about here. You yeah. have people spewing crap that they don't even buy. And that goes and translates also into relationship building. Now, look, I understand there's a difference between advertising and marketing and relationship building. But the problem is, is that like most platforms that started with, you know, really wholesome intent at the beginning, like Facebook, then found their rude awakening and then had to go back to their wholesome beginnings to a certain extent. That's where I think we are in the relationship building process, because the idea of the network or the conversion hacker or whatever the hell you want to call it has become the, the norm. And as antiquated as it is, as much as people like us are, are you know shouting at the rooftops that this is not the right way to go about this. It still is that lazy norm that people are following because that's the way it's been done, and that's the way my grandfather did it. That's the you know so they follow these old school rules instead of looking forward to smarter alternatives. Um, look, I'm the first one to say I was somehow able to be an authentic human and still build a multi million dollar business with many people that work for me and be a, a pretty good connector and meet a lot of other amazing connectors because of the things I'm talking about and the things that my partner Ryan is talking about. And it's because we go into it realizing that the game is rigged to basically pretend people are sheep, that they right. can't just meet without five tips to networking, right? <laughs> that there's some formula that people are supposed to follow when there's not. It's simply put a mindset difference, right? It's the same thing when people say, I wanna get healthy. I will guarantee you, the people that say they want to get healthy are not the ones that are going to drink the Nutri Shake or going to the gym once a week. They're the ones that are fundamentally changing their entire lifestyle. When they wake up in the morning, what their workout routine is, how they're going to eat every day, what they're going to do with their time, how they're going to sleep. Like they're really going to be dedicated to it. And that's what we need to do in order to shift the mindset from this antiquated nonsense networker mentality to one that is a more holistic approach that has real opportunity to create real value for many people, which is the connector lens. Man, I'm so glad you're on the show. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, one thing that I find absolutely hilarious, like just like we've talked about it, like Facebook and LinkedIn and all of them changing their algorithm and everyone's like crying about it. No, like, that's the same. <laughs> But it's hysterical. I, I agree with you. It's hysterical. Yeah, and it's like they're just doing that so they can try to like preserve like the actual good content and the actual good human connection up mm -hmm. there, you know, and not deteriorate with like all these bots and and spammers and marketers and and all this nonsense. Well, wait, wait, uh, here's here's a crazy point to that though. What mm -hmm. I think people are, are are learning, and I wrote a piece about this, and I would encourage your. Um, your listeners, your watchers to take a look at. So for ad week, if you type in Facebook hammer drop, I think that was part of the headline, uh, ad week and my name, Scott Gerber, you'll find an article that I wrote for ad week when Facebook changed its algorithm about what brand marketers thought uh, that the sky was collapsing, right? And <laughs> basically my premise was pretty simple and I think it holds true even for this conversation, which is you have a lot of people out there today that have confused audience with community. Hmm. You know, the idea of an audience is a passive group of people that are somehow, you know, at some part of your experience, a viewer, a passive person, you know, maybe reading a piece of content or, you know, liking and sharing something once in a while, but they're not an engaged community member, right? They're not like having a multi-way dialogue. They're not engaged with a high level of affinity. And the problem is, is when you are building these audiences on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and so forth, you're basically building audiences, but not communities. So what happens when all of a sudden something changes and you've invested all this money, time, and treasure on basically trying to build this community that you've just found out as an audience? Well, guess what? They just close the door and you don't have that audience anymore. And you can't transport that community because it was never a community to something else. And so I think you're getting the sense now that a lot of brand marketers especially have gotten caught with their pants down, that they invested a ton of money. And rather than actually look at what the real problem is, oh, oops, we decided to build our entire community as a platform instead of as a series of people, right? And we invested in dumping money into our Facebook page rather than dumping it into a community that happens to interact on our Facebook page, which is a fundamental distinction. They, what do they do? They blame Facebook. They say, how dare you? And you know what? I understand the concern. I'm not trying to make it sound like I don't get it. They're investing real money. They thought promises were made to them. But at the same time, how foolish is it that they're not blaming themselves of not realizing, guess what? Sometimes you can't expect water to come out of a spout if you don't own the damn spout. That's the reality. And that goes for any kind of thing where people are building what they deem our communities today, but in more cases than not, our actual audiences. I think it's a different mindset you have to put yourself in, different level of investment, and it's a different level of affinity you actually have with your tribe. That's what people should be striving for. 
Yeah, and like a big part of that for me at least is taking a step back and looking at the big picture, right? Like if you're actually trying to join a community, you don't want to be limited to, as you said, one platform, right? Um, and I think one of the one of the best things that um, well, hold on, Scott, let me let me get your thoughts. What do you so in terms of that stuff? So how do you feel about like like email lists, um, mm -hmm. website registration, like things where you own your own uh, environment? Absolutely. So look, I'm always an advocate for having some form of environment. You also mm. want to be where your community is. But here's the difference, mm. right? Like, for example, if you are using Facebook as a tool, as we do with many of our communities, like YEC, we're not looking at it as a marketing tool or something where we're trying to get likes and shares. We're using it more from the perspective of, say, a Facebook group, right? Mm. And so you are learning with other people that you know, you're in conversations, you're driving that conversation. So, but if Facebook ever said, Hey, I'm turning off the Facebook groups feature, you're not there because Facebook groups is the tool why you're doing it. You could transport that community because the ethos you've created, the moderation, the facilitation, the curation, all those things allow for people to understand that just happened to be the platform you use, but you can easily, because you have the data, very important, you own uh, or co-own that data that you, people trust you with to be able to move to whatever the next thing is. But I'm never going to say you should use an email list versus this, or you should be on Twitter versus that. What I'll say is, is that if you feel you don't own your community and, and you could be honest about that, meaning, you know, you are not in control of the data. You're not in control of direct levels of communication. You are fundamentally only relying on third parties to be able to house those experiences. And you, in your worst nightmare, if something went wrong, you couldn't find a way to extract those folks or they wouldn't feel the value of being extracted. That's the mistake. And a lot of that doesn't have to do with the platform. A lot of them it has to do with the level of attention, care, engagement, and moderation that you are doing in your experiences because that's the secret sauce. The secret sauce is the humanity mm -hmm. that you're infusing to build the connections and the resources and the conversation. That is not easily attainable, and that's what they're there for. That's what they bought the ticket for, so to speak. So if you can deliver that, it doesn't matter where you're delivering it. You're just trying to make it initially easy for your users with the understanding that it's a transportable community. I had uh, Neil Patel on this podcast a few days ago, and you know he's Love Neil. Neil's good. Yeah, guy. He, yeah. You know he, you know he, he pumps out he pumps out so many articles. He's he's like the the online Jesus. Um, <laughs> online Jesus. I'm yeah. gonna write that in Twitter. Neil, I heard you're the online Jesus. <laughs> yeah, and like, and he basically just told me the same exact thing. And I I find that you know like I I don't want to put it in in such a binary way, but like. Winners are, are winners. Like you, you understand the, the picture. You understand that there's a lot of moving parts. You understand that things can change. And the fact that you understand that will set you apart and that will set you to actually succeed in the long term on the internet. Appreciate that. Yeah. So Scott, I got I to gotta make a confession to you, man. Um, when I started out, you know, connecting uh, with people on LinkedIn and trying to meet people, I go to people's profiles, like if they seem interesting, I send them a connection request and we talk and then I'd say, you know, how can I help you? <laughs> Hate that question. Okay, keep going, keep going. We're, we're gonna diagnose the problem, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, so like I, I'd ask them that and then they'd be like, yeah, sure, okay. okay. Who, are you? Who are you? Yeah, exactly. So, and like, that, that's so weird though, because like from my perspective, I don't know a lot and I'm just like, okay, what's a good thing that I can say but but in reality, that's just like a, a crappy effort, yep. like just slap, you know, slap it against the wall, yep. right? Right. Well, for, it's the social script of social scripts. But it's not mm. only that that question is the worst question. It's the idea of that question and others put this in a way that millions can relate to without all the internet marketing or being LinkedIn. Imagine this, if you will. You know, if it's not you and I, but we're first time meeting as two other people, right? Um, and I came to you and I said, hey, I know we just met. In fact, you haven't even said three words yet. But you know what? I think you're awesome. I'm going to be your best friend. We should be best friends. You know what I mean? Like we just know so much about each other. But you know, what's a best friend anyway? Best friends just help each other, right? So you know what? Because we're best friends now, could you introduce me to the five people that are closest to you in the world that you've spent 20 years building relationships with? Because we're best friends, right? That's what people sound like, like in a different way, right? And who the hell would do that? 
who would actually be like, wow, that sounds like a great idea. You know what I mean? Like, but that is what the internet, because of the ease of access, we've mistaken ease of access for ease of relationship building. And that just ain't the case, right? Because everything now has become bastardized by the marketing set. Okay, so it's how can I help you as a marketing script? Okay, even in real world conversation, there's that real world again. Even in real world conversation, if you've been talking to somebody for 10 minutes, okay, and you say, how can I help you? Immediately, most people are like, oh, God, how can I? <laughs> you know, uh, no, I'm good. You know, and it kills the whole conversation because two things. Number one, you just freaking met me. And number two, if we just talked for 10 minutes and the conversation was even remotely interesting, wouldn't you know how to help me? And you would just say, hey, you know, I might know someone or, oh, I might have this resource I can help you with or, oh, that's a challenge I had last year. I'm happy to take you through what we did. But that's not what you did. You did the la, 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 for 10 minutes and then said, how can I help you? Because why? You wanted something from them. And that's the key. That's what no one ever talks about. Well, I'm going to slap the people. That's what no one ever talks about, right? No one ever talks about their reasons. They talk about the script, the steps, the whatever, right? So here's what I would say are better ways to actually mm -hmm. have conversations. Now, mind you, I'm not going to say always use this question because it's the same thing with the networker philosophy. Everything I'm saying is part of a framework and a mindset, but it has to work for you. It's not follow these five tips. It's this is the mindset you should be in to then develop what's comfortable for you, right? But in a conversation, digital or real world, okay, your job is to be the Sherlock Holmes of discourse. You are a context miner. You are trying to find the nuggets of the other person that they are ultimately going to share with you with great questions. Not because you're trying to extract value, but because you're trying to figure out a puzzle, if you will, to help them solve a challenge or find a way to be actually meaningfully valuable to them. Or simply put, to store that knowledge for later and as you develop a relationship, build a bigger profile of someone that's going to allow you longer term to create value potentially for that individual, not necessarily that day, that minute. So you might say, hey, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. That's usually the LinkedIn bona fides, right? Wrong. Don't do that. Instead, it's like, what are you excited to do when you wake up in the morning these days? What's, what's the big thing? Why? Because most people are not going to talk about, this is what I do for a living. Maybe they're going to talk about a specific project they're working on that's interesting. Maybe they're going to talk about a new hobby they've taken up. And instantly, you've made the conversation naturally about the other person talking about what they're actually passionate about things that they're actually excited to talk about because they don't get to do that in everyday life. And then if it is a work thing, you could go and say, so what's success look like for you? How do you know if you've actually achieved success? What are you doing? You're finding the end result that they're looking for. And then methodically, now you're able to do follow-up questions that back you into the steps that it's going to take to get mm -hmm. that ladder climbed, right? So by doing that, you're learning a tremendous amount. And then in your head, you're thinking, oh, well, maybe I know John. John might be able to be the person for that. Oh, well, Sally last year solved that problem. Maybe I can make an introduction. And whether you offer it or not, or later you come back with serendipity and say, after getting Sally's you know, a buy-in that you met this great person you want to introduce her to and she's cool with it, now you have a serendipity connection, something that wasn't expected, something that did go off as marketing because you didn't like put yourself on a pedestal in minute one because you wanted to say, how can I help you? And you've actually created an authentic relationship that you showed you cared and you showed you didn't tell. So I just think most people are freaking lazy. They don't put thought into things. They're trying to get where they need to go uh, in where they'll be in 30 years from now and one year from now because they looked at some, you know, entrepreneur magazine piece that said how to be a billionaire in 60 days <laughs> because the one out of one billion people that actually happened to you think you're the next one. But people don't remember one key thing. And this is the number one lesson I learned as a young person um, from a key mentor of mine that I did not fully appreciate or understand at the time. Very, very simply, she said, uh, my thing to her was she was a, a power broker behind the scenes for a lot of very name recognizable mega billionaires and entrepreneurs. Like she was and still is very much that person. And I said, Holly, you have worked with all these killers, all these kings of the castle and queens of the castle. How can I do what they did? but not in 30 years, but in like two years, right? <laughs> and I was like 21, like anybody else trying to hack the system. And she said something very, very straightforward to me, which is look, real relationships take real time and you can't cheat real time. And that's the fact. And the smartest people 
optimized to create more real time for their real relationships. And how did they do that? Because they found ways to cheat their time. So how did they cheat their time? They became more selective in who they invested their time in. They became more selective in who was in their inner circle. They became more selective in the opportunities they actually took on and shared or were a part of. And over time, they really finite created a lifestyle design that was geared towards amazing people and mutual achievement towards success without all the noise and the crap around them. That's the secret. It's not a big secret, but that's the secret. The best super connectors in the world are the top productivity hackers. The only time you'll hear me say the word hacker in any way, shape, or form because it's true because they're trying to figure out how to get 28 hours in a 24-hour day and how to take their preset relationship time from one hour to 1.5 hours a day to be able to create 1.5 hours of exponential value for someone else. But they're prioritizing their success. They're prioritizing the things that matter. They're being highly selective about what they do, who they speak to, what they're involved in, and how they're going to dedicate the resources they have available. You know, and there's that quote, you know, your net worth is the quality of your relationships. And that that couldn't be more accurate. And I think that, you know, there's there's like the the original way that that you look at it and it's very shallow. It's very it's 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 all vanity. Um, you, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about it as if like, you know, hookups versus, you know, getting to actually know a person and then you kind of shift. And then like, you look at this world where like your social status now is like how many followers you have. And like, yep. that doesn't matter. Ma- it's all yeah, vanity. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, I think eventually, you know, once, once all sorts of tools and the, the human story kind of figures it out i think we'll move past this and i think we'll look back to this time and be like man that was a weird time of the internet but you know black mirror it's like the black mirror episode (laughs) yeah definitely so you know scott you're you're a really animated guy i i want to assume you're an extrovert um no i'm a hardcore introvert (laughs) (laughs) yeah no extrovert type a type a i think would be pretty pretty obvious yeah yeah. So, all right. So, so in terms of, of people that are introverts may yep. consider themselves got some social anxiety yep. and, you know, th- let's say they're at like an event and yep. they're trying to network with, with, with real people. How, how do they do that? Cause it, yep. it's harder. Well, no, it's not. And that's the secret. Okay. Mm. So just to be clear, my partner, Ryan is the hardcore introvert and I am the hardcore mm. extrovert. And when we wrote I the see. book, that was a big part of what we wanted to do. We wanted to show mm. that you can be a super connector with the same goals, vision, and mission that you have as a connector, but it doesn't mean you're going to go about it the same way. So here's the thing. If you're an introvert and you showed up at an event, you've already failed because that's not your strength, right? Yeah. What, what did I say before? Connectors are incredibly selective human beings around what they do, where they are, what they say, who they're being with, all those things. So if you've put yourself in a pond that you're not comfortable in, you've already failed the selectivity test. So what we find is that introverts mm. are actually in many cases better connectors than extroverts. And the reason is, is because they put themselves into situations that are more comfortable, which usually means a more intimate setting. So for example, let's say they wanted to meet people that they knew were going to be at this mega conference, right? Does that mean they attend the mega conference? No, it does not. What it means is they're going to spend weeks and weeks researching the people they want to invite that are at that conference to a private oasis, whether it's a coffee, whether it's a small curated bar event, whatever it is. And they're going to slowly build a quorum, 5, 10, 15 people, maybe, maybe less, that basically is going to help to connect people that should know one another, put the introvert at the center of attention and center of sphere of influence, but in a way they're comfortable with, smaller setting, more meaningful conversation, more research can be done on how they start conversations because they're going to know more about the people. And they're going to basically convene a small grouping. And they're still going to get all the value created that they would have loved to do if they could not have a panic attack in the middle of a larger room. They're going to do it in their own in their own way in their own set and they can then build these sort of mini groups that are going to help them to do that so i think what we need to stop doing and again i don't fault you for this because i think it's the right question because that's how people think about it in the networking parlance right what do you do at a networking event well maybe sometimes you shouldn't attend the stupid networking event and instead think about it a little bit smarter of how do you achieve the same goal but a different process right and so 
you have to do what's comfortable for you. If you're a hardcore extrovert even, I would say, it doesn't mean you still go to the stupid networking event. You still might wanna take the introvert approach. Now, your private curated thing might be able to be 25, 30 people versus five or 10, but the point is you are actually being seen as a convener, a curator, a connector of people that should know one another where you actually put time and effort and energy into pulling the right kinds of people that probably should know one another into a smaller setting. Oh, which by the way, they, the actual people that attend these smaller group settings probably also want the same value, right? They don't attend the conference because they see value in 5,000 people. They are also trying to meet the right 10, 15, 20 people. So you've just taken all the work out of it. You remove the friction from the connecting opportunity. You can ask them questions about where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are, what are they working on right now? Send an email digest before it. Now all of a sudden everybody knows everybody before they walk in the room. So my point is don't, and whether it's this question that you've asked about the networking event or anything else, nothing is how it should be in the way of the connector. Your real estate is your real estate, not the rules of the person that necessarily created the real estate. The same way that Facebook's main goal was not to get people to use Facebook groups as the only tool that you ever use on Facebook, right? Because if anything, that's one of the lowest level ad product units that they have. It's not nearly as successful as say the newsfeed, I'm sure, right? But that's how a connector uses it because that's the right tool set for the job. Same way with a conference. Great people go to conferences, but networking for networking's sake, as we've learned, is stupid and makes no point. It's not curated. It's not selective. And you're oftentimes just meeting random people that might be great people, but actually are not the kinds of people that you are looking for for mutual success that are not like focus on the things you care about that aren't the right people for long-term value. And while you might say, well, Scott, that's really mean of you to cast out great people that, you know, the reality is you only have so much time in a day and you have to make sure that time is invested wisely. And, you know, look, I'm a family man. I've got four kids. You know, if you fit into my schedule, I think you're an incredibly amazing person that has real value. I can deliver to you or I want to invest in you because I believe in the bigger picture of what the community that I'm creating with people like you in it means. But it doesn't mean I have to just go and meet everybody and their mother because I'm some extrovert and I was told by a networking guru that the more business cards I hand out, the more value I have to offer. It's not the way to do it. Rethink the real estate. Rethink the process. Fit to your strengths, not to what you're being told. Hmm. And, uh, you know, Scott, a recurring theme on this podcast is uh, self-awareness because that's mm -hmm. huge. Yep. Um do you, do you have any particular, like any things that, that or advice that you'd give to people to kind of develop a, a, a sense of awareness that's, yep. you know, past of, of what they have already? Yep. So self-awareness is probably one of the crucial traits. We, we say there's a couple. There's emotional intelligence, empathy, self-awareness, and curiosity. Mm -hmm. Those are the big connector traits. And when it comes to self-awareness, I'm going to tell a quick story to give you a sense of someone who didn't have self-awareness, and that was my first aha moment. This is going back about 15 years ago when I was in college. I was at NYU uh, for film school, ironically. Um, and basically, I was selected as one of five students to meet with this very big-name Hollywood executive um, that basically was doing these small off-site events. And the principal idea was, you know, as a producer, which is what I was studying to be, um, this person is the actual person at the studio who green lights projects. So we wanted to learn like not the glorified version of Hollywood, but how does this actually happen, right? What are you looking for? What's your lens on it? How are you achieving ROI? What, you know, you're looking at a script. How do you know what that's going to do? And so this was a huge moment. There was five of us. We get into the room and not even, I don't even think introduction started when all of a sudden one of the girls in the room opens up her bag, pulls out a screenplay, looks the guy right in the face, plops it down in front of him and says, this is your next movie. This is going to be the biggest thing. You're going to miss out if you don't buy it. This is your thing. And hijacks the entire room. Okay. Now, this was my first like heart attack in the throat moment, except sort of semi-professionally, because in her mind, she believed her self-awareness, this was her moment right? Like that was her chutzpah, right? She didn't give a fuck about anybody. This was not about us learning. This was the hustler coming in, giving the Hollywood story. So in 20 years of the cocktail party, when she's hanging out with Leek DiCaprio and Brad Pitt, she's going to talk about this time where she plopped the thing on the table. They start in the movie and the rest is history, right? I'll give you a guess if that actually happened. 
This guy was mortified. The conversation ended up being miserable. It started off horribly. All of us felt like we were so embarrassed. This girl was representative of our school. We're sitting there as if he's waiting for the next idiot in the room to do the same thing. And we just didn't know what to do. So the meeting became a problem. That day I learned more people than not have no self-awareness. Because again, they fundamentally believe that confidence and self-awareness are the same thing. Or they are very self-aware internally. Like you could say, I am a confident, well-spoken you know, person that's determined that I'm going to get it done, but have no external self-awareness to know how that is actually perceived. This is mm. why a lot of times type A's, while they might be wonderful people, are perceived as arrogant pricks, right? Because they are just, Rah! you know, like right in your face, like hardcore. And you don't know how to take it, especially if you're an introvert. So you're just like, whoa, buddy, back off, you know? So the reality here is, is that self-awareness is as much important internally as it is externally. And so first and foremost, you really do have to assess yourself internally. Um, and sometimes that could be done yourself if you're intellectually honest. Sometimes, you know what, it's not bad to see somebody like a therapist or someone to analyze yourself. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But for external purposes, and this is the odds, honest truth, what, what I believe works, you should go to your inner circle, your most trusted people, right? And these aren't necessarily business people. It could literally be your best friend in life, you know, that you fundamentally trust, whatever it is. And you just go and say, how do I come off? What do you think if you didn't know me and you had to tell someone about me meeting me, what would you say to them? Right. But asking really hard questions that you might not like the answers to. I mean, I remember early on, you know, in my early 20s, because, again, you do see this bravado in this animation. You know, I probably my ego was probably off the charts at that time. I mean, I was producing, you know, major entertainment projects in the industry at age 20 for some, you know, music acts today that are very much still on the main stages of, you know, the top 100, top 200 artists in the world. And it gets to your head. And that also, by the way, is why I failed miserably, nearly bankrupted myself, and then had to build myself back up, which is one of the best things that could have ever happened to me at a young age. But the reality is that I went to some of my closest friends who are still my closest friends to this day, and I said, hey, man, like, what, do you, what would you say? They said, if I didn't know you, I'd say you're an arrogant son of a bitch. I'd say you're a pompous ass. I'd say you're, you, you gloat too much, that you care as if your shit doesn't stink. All the things that you don't want to hear when you're, you know, about yourself, because these are the people that are like family. But if you've got the skin to hear it, it helps you to actually advise how best to change it. Because no one that's just sort of a kind of sort of maybe acquaintance is ever going to be honest with you. And so you need some, who are your brutal, honest players that are going to tell you, hey, man, to be honest, these are the things I would tell you. And get a couple people. So it doesn't have to just be one person that tells you. Maybe that person's a little off or they're skewed or they're jealous, you know, understandably. But on the other side, if three or four people are telling you, you know, you might have some stuff to work on. And I think that's okay. And I think the earlier you can do that, the better you can put yourself in a mindset for success and the better you could be as a person to correct the things that ultimately you're going to be better off without. So that's what I would do. Yeah. And it might be uncomfortable, but it's, you know, it's needed for the long run, just like you said. Be the best uncomfortable situation you'll ever be in, in the long yeah, run. Yeah, exactly. Scott, final question. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you've been around the block, you, you know, as you said, you fell down, you had to climb back up out of all of your time, you know, what, what's the number one, most important element sense of perspective that, that you've learned in, in based on your experience? You know, I think I go back to what I told you earlier about what my mentor said to me about, you know, you can't, uh, real relationships take real time, but you can't cheat real time. And I've since amended that mm -hmm. to say, but your job is to cheat your time to create more relationship building time, right? Um, it's, so, it's such a simple yet profound statement. I would argue that if you're being intellectually honest with yourself, no matter who's listening and watching this, okay, if you honestly are going to tell me that you are booked the minute you wake up, till the, the minute you go to sleep every single day with incredibly life-altering, meaningful time blocks of, of, or demands of your time, I'm going to call you a liar right here, okay? We all have five extra minutes. We all have, you know, a series of things we do because we're just too lazy to get them off our schedule or we're too nice or feel we're going to be seen as mean if we maybe step back from some of the things that are a little less meaningful in our lives. And again, that's a choice. That doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's a choice. So I think the thing that, that really taught me most value is you're having kids. Mm -hmm. You really, it puts time in a lot of perspective because they're only going to be this age for so long. And so you start having to make, you know, that's what you, you have to go in, in real deep with yourself. Like if I go to dinner with John, I'm not going to see my daughter tonight. 
If I go to jo- dinner with John, Sally, Sue, and Sam the four nights this week, I'm not going to see my daughter four nights this week. And then next week, she's going to be two inches taller. And then in six weeks, she's going to be eight inches taller. But you get my point. Like, it puts things in perspective because it's the only thing other than death that really makes it clear that we are with this finite resource that we don't own, we can't buy more of, and we can't control. And when you Mm -hmm. really put that in perspective about the amount of time, days, and relationships you've got left potentially on this earth as a human being of seeing what really matters, are you really going to say that night at the bar was something that I could have, no, I never could have parted with. That extra time playing video games, like, man, that was the shit. I'm never going to get rid of that. That's my jam. You're probably not. You're going to look back and be like, man, there's so much more I could have, should have, would have done. And that's the big thing. What ultimately people look at is they look at the asset, which is time. What they don't look at is the cause and effect, which is time wasted regret. So I would say that the biggest thing I've done is try to prioritize my life in a way that I am proud to go to sleep every night. It doesn't mean, again, that every minute of the waking hour is the perfect minute, but I do my best to make sure it is, whether that's because of business or personal life, relationship building, whatever it is, that's the key. And I do believe that the best thing, whether it's going deeper you know, with the loved ones you have, uh, whether it's going deeper with the people that you respect most in your life, your inner circle, that's the key to happiness and success. It's not trying to keep going wider. We all don't, we, you want to talk about Dunbar's number at the 150 or whatever. The reality is humans are not meant to be scaled. We are not meant to know 5,000 friends. No one can know 5,000 friends. And while you might know many people, some that maybe show up in season one of your life and then come back for you know a role in season four, okay, there's people that are there every season. And so I guess the three things I would say is, Mind your time, try not to have regrets, go deep, not surface level. Your life will be more rewarding as a result. Scott, I just want to take a moment here and acknowledge you. You're, you're a terrific human 2.0, and I think you, you're, you're offering a really articulate communications bridge that this world needs right now, and you got to keep doing what you're doing, man. Scott, where can people go to talk to you and check out your book? Sure. You can follow me on Twitter at Scott Gerber with two T's. You can also follow my partner, Ryan Paw, R-Y-A-N-P-A-U-G-H. And you can check out the book, either buying it anywhere books are sold or going to superconnectorbook.com. Scott, it was an absolute pleasure. And thank you, everybody, for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. This has been your host, Mark Metry. Thank you for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and you chose to listen to this. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about Humans 2.0 so they can improve as well. If you loved listening to that, I would love your feedback, whether you're watching this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and anything else. Keep learning on the Humans 2.0 podcast.